Welcome to another episode of Badass Banking. And first of all, I want to thank the Trevelyan Group for sponsoring this episode. We've got Keith from Trevelyan with us. By the way, this episode is going to be available on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Radio Public, Overcast, Pocket Cast, and the Jimmy Kimmel Show. Only kidding about Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> Joining me today are Patrick Sells. Patrick is the guy in the bottom there, if you can see him with the hat. He's out in San Diego, even though his bank, uh, which is Quantic Bank, is located in New York. We're not going to go how he got there or why he's still there. He is the chief innovation officer, and I should note he's the American banker, digital banker of the year for 2020. So it's an honor to have him here. And Keith, up there on the left with Rocky Balboa behind him, very apropos, he's in the Philadelphia area. And he is a search director at Trevelyan. Again, Trevelyan sponsoring this episode. I love Trevelyan because they focus on, on search in the financial services and fintech space, but they're really focused on culture. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. Keith and I have had a couple conversations in the past, and we also had a conversation with Patrick last week, and we were talking about digital culture. So Patrick, has the banking world lost the war on talent? Hey Brian, it's good to be on with you. And uh, sorry for a little bit of background noise. I uh, think shut off in a moment. But that's, that's California living. That's called, what is that, the I-5 behind you? The buzz of the traffic? <laughs> exactly. But I think the answer to your question, I think it's a pretty, I don't even know that the question needs to be asked because I think it's so obvious, right? Like when was the last time in the last decade or two decades you heard someone coming out of college saying, I'm going to go work at a community bank, right? It didn't happen. And I think what's happened then is the, the generation that grew up digitally native isn't at banks, they're at other companies. And that's where we're seeing all this innovation and fintechs and happen and banks are lagging. You know, one of the things I talk about or think about is the greatest existential threat to the industry is this. If we do not figure out how to change the culture and way we recruit, where are we going to be a decade from now? Yep. Now, Keith, I don't know about you. When I think of banking, I think of Thurston Howell the third and, um, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Drysdale from the Beverly Hills Billies. I, you know, yeah. is, my, is that is that how you think too? I mean, my memories of uh, community banks, to be honest, Brian and Patrick, is uh, going with my mom Friday afternoons before you know the weekend, uh, waiting in line at some, you know, smoke-filled rooms, and waiting in line for her to uh, take out money for the weekend. Um, there was nothing exciting about it. We didn't want to go there. Me and my sister. Uh, and to be completely honest, it wasn't fun. <laughs> and what's interesting about what Patrick specifically, but other innovators in community banking are doing, is they're trying to make it fun and you know help the consumer. You know, look at it from the consumer point of view. Um, I didn't come up through banking. I came up through uh, FP&A, financial corporate finance within companies. And we always very innovative companies that. Number one was focus on the consumer. What do they want? How do we make it easy for them? And banking just never seemed that way. I know it's going in that direction and that's what Patrick and, and other innovators are pushing and it's great to see, it really is. You just gave me a fond memory of the freestanding ashtrays that you would see in front of the teller yes. stands, remember? Yes. Like you yes. could have a cigarette in your hand as you walked up to a teller asking for your 20 or 30 or 40 bucks, whatever it was you asked for back then. And you got a lollipop. And that well, was thank, about it. Thank, good, <laughs> thank goodness for digital. That's all I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. And the no smoking laws. <laughs> so, so Patrick, you know, tell me a little about, you've had like you know, dozens and dozens of bankers reach out to you to ask you more about what it takes to truly drive digital. You want to talk a little about that? Yeah. So I think as Quantic evolved from a traditional community bank into an all digital bank, uh, you know, we've learned a lot along the way and got interest and attention in the industry. And I've been able to talk to well over a hundred banks now about this concept of true digital or how do you help find their true digital identity? right? Quantix digital identity is different than other banks and theirs will be from ours, but there's a lot we can learn and share and provide um, from policies, procedures, partners. And so we, that's all in something we're calling true digital. Um, it's a new kind of entity that we're launching. It's free for banks really to help them. But at the end of the day, one of the analogies that I use when you think about this is I grew up in the cornfields of Indiana. 
And I remember seeing the farmers every season put down a bunch of seeds and you would see some areas where it would take and others where it wouldn't. And today there's all kinds of the seeds in the, in the banking industry is technology. There's all kinds of technology available. The problem is it isn't sticking, right? A lot of banks are behind. And why is that? Because the soil isn't good. And that goes back to Brian, your first question about culture. The culture at banks need to be something, it needs to be completely changed. That to me is where the innovation needs to happen, not on the technology. Fix this, the technology will take and come. Yeah, so how do we get people excited about banking from a career point of view? And, and I'll open that to either of you because I, I think you probably would come at it from different perspectives. Yeah, I can, I can go first here, uh, Brian. So we, we actually hosted, Trevelyan, we hosted uh, Patrick uh, Jill Castilla, who I think you know, Brian, very well. Um, Jason Henrik and Ram Emanuel from Q2 about two months ago. And the, the video was, or the roundtable was specific to culture and mindset and innovation. And there was an interesting uh, topic that was brought up by Jill that once you start getting this you know, innovative culture, people will start coming to your bank. You know, she'll put out a, a job application or a job post for, you know, chief marketing officer or, or something else. And all these resumes will come in from different industries because she's known as an innovator. She wants to, you know, bring in talent, uh, talent that's, you know, quick to, quick to fail. And I know, Patrick, that's a word that is not used much in banking. It's very risk adverse. Uh, as you know, Brian, um, if there's not like an outcome that you can predict that's going to be 100% or 95% successful, you'll just scrap the whole project. And that kind of goes against everything that fintechs and innovative tech companies are doing. Um, and I'll throw it over to Patrick to kind of lead off of that. But um, yeah, it was very interesting, that roundtable. Yeah, you know, Keith, you're absolutely right. And the story you share of Jill is spot on. I think, you know, what, it, what does it feel like to work at a bank? Is it fun, right? And I think so often if you look like we're doing a study right now of all the core values of banks and the, the difference or the variance is like 1%, right? In other words, it's all blase. And really those types of values, integrity, work hard, teamwork, those aren't core in the sense, those are permission to play like no shit. If you don't have those, you're not gonna have a job anywhere. You know, gotta really develop core values. If you go look at tech companies or even some of the new restaurants we're seeing come out it doesn't have to just be in technology you see things that are inspiring they're unique they they resonate with you what about a bank culture resonates with any unique part of someone's personality right we got to start going there and infusing it with life with purpose with meaning i think compensation has to be reset all the money goes to the top at the board and executive level and it's not down below and we looked at the average pay in bank versus another company's below benefits are screwed up there's no valuing of the person. I think that's one of the great things we've seen with the technology movement is, you know, how we think about paid parental leaves, for, for example. Places of value recognizes the value on the person. Banks, by and large, aren't doing this. Right, right. So do you think innovation is reframing assumptions? Yeah, so that's how I think about it in the sense of, and I can kind of share a fun personal story. I was in sixth grade the suburbs of Richmond, Virginia, and I'd moved to a small town of 10,000 people in Missouri. And for whatever reason in this town, the cool thing to do was to shave your arms. And like, it wasn't a challenge to something. We didn't have a swim team, right? But I started shaving my arms because I wanted to fit in. And then about two years later, we'd moved to a small town in Indiana, of about 2,000 people. Shaving your arms there was not cool. <laughs> it was the opposite. But I learned something that there's these underlying assumptions that people hold and they don't challenge. And innovation comes when we're willing to say, what if this no longer was true? How does everything else, even if it's the same change because of that? That is the process to me of innovation. And this is an example of, we're so focused externally around technology and what's the newest code. Whereas there's this assumption because our culture is good. Who doesn't want to come work at a bank? It used to be prestigious. We played a vibrant role in communities. I think that some assumption needs to be relooked at. Yeah, I think maybe the the three piece suit had something to do with that personally. <laughs> we need to ban suits from the, uh, from the banking experience. T-shirts. T-shirts. There you go. Okay, so let's talk about the concept of vendors versus partners. I ha I hate the term vendor. I've written about it in the past on a couple of posts for like CU Insight and I think American Banker. I just don't like the term. What are your thoughts on what, what it takes to make a real partner versus a vendor? 
Yeah, I'll start here, Brian. So um, with banks like uh, Patrick's Bank, Quantic, uh, it, it's really understanding the culture. So if we're going to go out there and search for top talent, you know, we're, we're surgeons. We're, we're not just, you know, I like to say primary care physicians. You know, we're, we're surgeons. We want to find somebody who has the skills, of course, can do the job, hits all those boxes. But more importantly, to firms like Quantic and other innovative firms, are these people critical thinkers? Do they, you know, do they want to come in and almost have that consultant mindset to say, we can do this better. Why are we doing this? Because some people aren't. And I'm not saying that's bad or not. It really is kind of if you came up through banking the last 20, 30, 40 years, not that much has changed. Um, some has. And some banks have really changed. But I go to a, maybe a local community bank here in uh, Philadelphia, and it is like stepping back into the 80s, except for the smoke. You know, it's smoke free now. Um, but you can make branches fun. You know, I was talking to somebody a couple months ago, and they're talking about making the branch maybe like a community center where people can come and they have conferences, and they have meetings, and they do Zoom calls with clients. Uh, make it a place where it's not just transactional. Make it kind of a community hub. If you're going to have branches, if you're not going to have as many branches, the customer journey, right, Patrick? It, it's all about the customer journey and making them feel like you're not just another number, that you're actually, they know what you're talking about and they have your background and they suggest products that matter to you and they understand you. Right. And playing off your, the, the word that really resonated, this idea of transactions, right? Mm -hmm. If you hear the word vendor, you just inherently think it's transactional right? This is a third party. They, and as long as they do their job and I do my job, I'm happy. In the moment it's not working, we move on versus this idea of partnership. And until I've only been in the industry for two years, I had never referred to a partner as a vendor before coming into this. It kind of took me by surprise, right? And if we operate as though our core is a vendor, as though our partners like Trevelyan are vendors, you're not gonna get very far, right? What we need is a, the sense of partnership is we need to be friends. You need to be able to text one another at night if something's going on. You need to know what's going on in each other's businesses and lives. And that's how things get done in the world, right? Nothing gets done through vendors. I hate this whole idea of vendor and then even the term, because I think it speaks to what's so wrong, right? Like. And I can share this story. I hated our core FIS. I was told coming into this, you're going to hate your core. And I did. I wanted to do everything possible to get away from them. And then after about a year of hell, okay, wait a minute. And started to become friends with Shelly, who's, who's our account rep there. Now, today, I'd count her a friend and FIS a critical partner of ours. But that would never have happened as long as it was a vendor as opposed to a partnership. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a guy I, I quote a couple, a couple of times. His name is Ted Rubin. He's a marketing consultant. He's also a CMO of a startup now. I can't recall what it is. It has something to do with photography. He says that there's this thing called R on R when it comes to relationships, both B2C as well as B2B, and that is return on relationship. You got to take the time and the energy to understand a point of pain and then work together with your customer or your client in order to solve it and create milestones and a dialogue along the way that helps you show project, uh, progress. And then ultimately, you have a story to tell to share with others, which yields greater business and more influence. And that works if you're a bank, a credit union, or a, you know, quote unquote vendor. Mm -hmm. Totally. And also things will go wrong. And if you don't have that partnership, it sucks. You get stalled right? Keith and his partner, Brian at Trevelyan Group have become partners of ours. They're friends. And we've had some false starts and some things we were looking for and able to get on the phone to say, hey, man, this didn't work out, but let's talk through this. And it's not this antagonistic conversation or this feeling of like me against the world. It's, hey, okay, fine. I, I understand that. Let's, we, we can get through this together. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's candor and truth. And that comes with that kind of R on R experience. I mean, as you get, I mean, and on my own experience, a lot of the people that I've worked with over the last 10 to 15 years, from employees to quote unquote vendors, they're Facebook friends now. Now, Facebook is a sewer overall, but, <laughs> but it's, it's, I'm not going to go there. But you know, it's, it's enjoyable to see how these people live their personal lives. It, it, there's a, um, an equation there. Uh, where we're all really motivated by the same kinds of things, right? We want great lives, the best lives for ourselves and our families, and we enjoy our downtime. And it's good to see how 
you know, coworkers, peers, and vendors enjoy their downtime. It gives you something in common. I really like that. So, so Keith, tell me about this. You're working on a podcast idea. Yeah, I was actually inspired by you, Brian. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, there's always one. <laughs> um, we just, Brian and I, Brian Love, and I really liked being on you know, your show. I think it was one of the first episodes and uh, uh, kind of that whole Twitter company, you know, out there where you're just, uh, you know, going back and forth and it's almost like a conversation. And I thought there's not really a kind of talent, emerging talent, kind of casual, I call it like almost Joe Rogan-ish, and I'm a mm-hmm. Joe Rogan fan, very yeah. casual talent on emerging leaders within community banking, digital banking, and fintech. What's the next wave? Uh, because as you know, there's going to be a lot of retirements. Uh, there's 5,200 banks out there, community banks, and more uh, competition every day. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity. And as Patrick said, who's going to come in and kind of fill that gap? Is it going to come from outside the industry? Is it going to come from inside the industry? Um, so just giving these new emerging leaders a, a profile and also kind of going piggybacking on what Patrick said, how do we get more younger kids coming out of college or grad school really intrigued by community banking. Because the banks that we work with, like Quantic and other banks that, you know, I'll say their name later because we're really impressed by what they're doing. It is fun, man. They are partnering with FinTechs. They're coming up with new technology. They're white labeling products. It's not that view of nine to five bankers hours at all. And they, you just kind of have to, Patrick's a genius at marketing, get the word out. How do you get the word out that you can be, uh, what, are you, what are you, Patrick, 29, going to be 30? You can be a C-level executive and a CEO, basically, of a you know, billion, $2 billion uh, bank, maybe even larger, in your 20s. There's no story like that at a J.P. Morgan Chase or you know, a Goldman Sachs. It just doesn't happen. Or it's very rare. I don't want to say it doesn't happen. So there's so much opportunity and kind of, you know, coming up through that corporate world and working for large companies and smaller companies. Yeah, Patrick, you want to add add something? Yeah, I kind of call this like the tragedy of banking, right? Like community banks used to play vibrant roles. They were meaningful in in society. It was prestigious to work there. And nothing has changed about the fundamental nature of a bank. Like it's so cool to work at a bank and to think about just how much impact you can have on people, businesses, communities. And, you know, we got to make, we got to bring sexy back as JT said, right? Like it is cool to be a bank and there's a lot, there's, it's even easier in a way, I think, to actually innovate inside of a bank than outside of a bank because you're not beholden to partnering with the bank. And yeah, there's a challenge, right? Not only do you have to know marketing and technology, you have to learn regulations, right? Like there is a world of being a banker. I've had to think about, it's kind of like going to get a law degree. You get a law degree in medicine, right? Well, you got to, you kind of have to become a banker and an expert at something. But if you do that, one, how much smarter are you? How much better in the job market are you? It's actually better to be a banker than not a banker. And you can do all kinds of innovation and we can make it fun again. So, you know, let's bring sexy back. Was that a church I heard in the background? Or is that, are you watching Monty Python? Bring out your dead. Bring out your dead. California life. I'll right tell you, there. California living. Well, listen, yeah. guys, it's, it's been a real pleasure. I mean, you guys are doing some good stuff. And Patrick, I'm encouraged that, you know, the industry has identified younger people like you. By the way, we need some, we need some women on this show, too, because there's some young women out there that are doing some fantastic stuff. Oh, yes. In banking and in fintech. So help me identify a couple other victims. Yeah, I've got a bunch of friends. You know, I think what's Mm -hmm. fun is a whole bunch of young people kind of coming out of the woodworks in the industry. Like, wait, it's okay to say these kinds of things and do these kinds of things and wear a love hat when I go on a banking show. There's, so people are there. They just got to keep giving them a voice. Make it fun. Yeah. Yep. So Keith, when, when are you going to launch your podcast? What's the date? Oh, go? wow. So we're, uh, we're finalizing uh, the logo. We're finalizing kind of the marketing plan. We're going to get feedback from our buddy Patrick here. He already gave us a little feedback. Um, and uh, probably start recording very similar to what you do, uh, Brian, over the next week or two. Sweet. Um, Sweet. So I would say mid-October. Early awesome. Mid-October. And we're just going to go out there and very quick 10, 15, minute segments with emerging leaders. Yep. 
Well, listen, I'm going to post all your contact info for both of you guys so people have a way to reach out to you. Again, this is going to be on YouTube, obviously, because you're probably watching that on YouTube, but you also can catch it on Spotify and those other pod channels I had mentioned. So listen, gents, I really appreciate it. Uh, this has been awesome. Thanks, Brian, as always. 